Um, there's already been some fantastic papers today, and hopefully I'm going to be able to touch on a couple of the points that have already been raised, because they do come up. Um, well, the title, it's not actually the, the title of my latest um, steampunk thriller. Um, it is about Victorian ghost hunters, but in this sense um, that it's about the Society for Psychical Research, um, established in the Victorian era, um, with a continuous history that uh, really has seen it outlive all the competition so far. Um, but despite that, it finds itself in a situation of, uh, shall we say, crisis. And that's what I mean by this possible end of psychical research. And uh, we'll go into the ramifications of that. Um, as, as Peter said, that, um, you, know, you might know me as the editor of the Paranormal Review. Um, this particularly gives me an insight into the workings of the, today's society. And that's a, it's a very privileged <laughs> position, and I'm very honored to have that. Um, but I've also done a lot of historical research into um, particularly the First World War period and the role of the SPR then and into various investigations such as Angel of Mons and so on. And I've also done um, current sociological research on ghost hunters, who are they, what do they do, etc. So this um, hopefully gives me the long historical view plus the current sociological data. And it's that that I want to compare today to see uh, where we are, where we've come from and how we might progress. The key to this is that in surveying today's ghost hunters, very few are actually members of the Society for Psychical Research. Um, beyond that actual uh, survey data, anecdotal evidence also backs this up, in as much as um, when I go out and about lecturing to various audiences, um, I have had people come up to me afterwards and express surprise that the SPR is still going. There's a perception that it um, is a, an extinct um, dinosaur of a society. Um, and even at specialist conferences, um, not necessarily parapsychological ones, but uh, a conference uh, last year in Aberdeen, uh, looking at the supernatural in contemporary society, there were people in the audience who hadn't heard of the SPR, and again, there were people who thought that the SPR no longer existed. And that was a specialist audience that should have known better. Um, I'm not going to ask those questions today, because hopefully you all do know that the SPR exists and is still going. And it's also a terminological as well as organizational problem. Um, because, you know, who uses the term psychical research today other than the society? And this reflects on the problem that, you know, why should there be a crisis when we are in a period of such high popular interest in the paranormal? So let's look at the question of ghost hunting. Um, what is it about ghost hunting, and why might we think of it as particularly Victorian? So the haunted house stereotype um, begins with Pliny the Younger's story um, about Athenodorus 2,000 years ago. Um, he really set the scene, so to speak. But the idea of modern ghost hunt is framed in Boa Lytton's the Haunted and the Haunters. This was published in 1859 during the reign of Queen Victoria, of course. Um, the story is set in a haunted house, and uh, Bulba Lytton's protagonist approaches the problem like a modern ghost hunter, so he assembles um, various items of equipment. Um, I think in the first slide you saw, um, should we just have a quick look? Yes, look, um, he has a pistol here at, at, at the ready, as if that might help against uh, the undead. And um, this is something that um, Bill Willitton's protagonist takes with him, a pistol, I think he takes a flask of um, whiskey and uh, some very other sort of um, assorted items. Um, but as well as things that he can use to actually seal the house so that he can prevent other people from coming in and he can actually control the conditions of it. Um, then he searches the property and he conducts what would be called a, a vigil um, in today's ghost hunting parlance, meaning you know, he would do a nighttime observation. But really, it's the use of the first person in this story um, that has led at least one reader to think that uh, Bulwer Lytton was recounting real experiences. So the internal dynamics of the story, this uh, factual account, um, presentational style, is a, a foreshadowing, if you will, of paranormal reality TV. We might think of this as paranormal reality literature. 
So it functions on two levels. It's a blueprint for ghost hunting, and it's entertainment posing as fact. And these are two important factors. There's no evidence that uh, Bob Lytton did actually do any ghost hunting. Um, he was associated with 50 Berkeley Square, you know, the famous location in London, the ghosts there, but um, th there's no evidence for that. But others were organizing groups for the discussion or investigation of haunted houses and, and the question of apparitions. And particularly, there were rumors of um, a so-called ghost club at Cambridge University, going right back to 1802, as you can see here. Um, the mathematician Charles Babbage um, said that he was involved when he was at um, Cambridge University. He was involved in a ghost club um, during the years 1810 to 1812. And there were newspaper and magazine references to ghost clubs at Cambridge in 1851, 1859. Um, there's an organization today calling itself the Ghost Club, which you've probably heard of as well. It claims to have been established in 1862, although its reliable history is really dated to um, its foundation in 1882. Um, it lasted then until 1936. Um, it was refounded at least twice. That was particularly a private, invitation-only discussion group, not really an investigative group. Um, the scientific approach really came with the London Dialectical Society. They were established 1867 as a debating club, and uh, one of the first things they did was they set up a committee on spiritualism to investigate spiritualism. And they did that uh, in 1869. They presented their fi findings in 1870 and published a report in 1871. So that was quite a long period of um, you know, research, work, presentation, and publication on that subject. And in 1879, there was a society at uh, Oxford University. And they actually dissolved uh, shortly after the foundation of the SPR and turned over a lot of their files. And you can find those today in the SPR archives. Uh, one of the things they did was they actually inspired a lot of the, the, what the SPR would take on as its purpose, rules, and this committee structure. So the SPR didn't come out of the blue. Um, there was a long tradition before it of um, trying to get to the bottom of this question of ghosts, of haunted houses, etc. Now, just a quick recap. I mean, you, you've all heard the story. You know how it all happened. Um, but it is particularly a meeting between a f professor of physics, William Fletcher Barrett, and a journalist, Edmund Rogers, um, to put forward this idea that there should be um, a proper society for the investigation of um, particularly spiritualism, which was then, of course, um, in its heyday in, in the United Kingdom. Um, although it's um, Barrett as a, a physicist really was the kind of instigator, it was the humanities that would take the lead. Um, with a Trinity College cabal involving Henry Sidgwick, Frederick Myers, Edward Gurney, and Oxford man Frank Pod Podmore. And as we know, Sidgwick would become the first president. And you see at the top the, the start of that famous quote. Uh, to investigate that large body of debatable phenomena designated by such terms as mesmeric, psychical, spiritualistic, without, prepos without prejudice or preposition of any kind, and in the same spirit of exact and unimpassioned inquiry, which has enabled science to solve so many problems, once not less obscure, nor less hotly debated. And the key to this, to investigate and the appeal to science. That was what the society was all about. And one of the first things they did uh, was they set up six committees. And amongst those committees was this one, the Committee on Haunted Houses. And this involved Barrett and Podmore and, of course, some, some other investigators. This was their, their particular um, raison d'etre here. Um, but in their first report, they said, we have held ourselves in readiness to take any favorable opportunity for personally investigating the phenomena. Unfortunately, no opportunities to investigate haunted houses presented themselves. They received some witness testimonies from people saying that they had been in haunted houses, but that wasn't what they were looking for, and they found those unsatisfactory. Instead, what they discovered was that the owners of haunted houses were, were really reluctant to acknowledge that fact. Um, they feared um, damage to sort of property values. Um, in the report, this was described as a diplomatic reserve, um, it probably wasn't so diplomatic, and they distinctly declined to offer any facilities for their investigation. So the society's first ghost hunters were effectively locked out of the haunted house right before they could even get started. 
So ghost hunting by other means, what do I mean by that? Well, it, it was the work of the literary committee um, which bore fruit. This was uh, where we see Podmore joining forces with Myers and Gurney to analyze over 700 reports um, to conclude that some ghosts are telepathic projections made by people in distress, the classic crisis app apparition. And this, as we know, was published as Phantasms of the Living in two volumes, 1886. You might not know that this, was, uh, this actually made uh, the newspapers. It was reported in the Times. So it was uh, seen as a big event. Um, work continued after Gurney's untimely death, of course, um, collecting 17,000 survey returns on experiences of hallucinations. And about 10% they discovered um, claimed to have experienced hallucinations. This was the census on hallucinations. And a report on that was published 1894. And the death of Myers in 1901, that was just a few days before the death of uh, Queen Victoria. And we really, we see almost uh, what we might think of as uh, a society in mourning. You know, two of their key figures have, have passed away. Um, and the development now of, of in-house mediums, as we might put it, beginning particularly with Margaret Verrill in 1901, receiving messages purporting to come from Myers. And as you might guess, this developed into that huge network of uh, mediums and uh, communications that became known as the cross-correspondences. Um, an absolutely vast accumulation of data uh, lasting from its heyday 1901 to 1936 producing 3,000 plus scripts, so massive volume. And the SPR elite, as we might think of them, um, were mostly convinced that this was a um, convincing demonstration of proof of the survival of personality after death. And we see here, really, in these three things, that distinct research programs have emerged that led to significant breakthroughs, even if we don't actually um, acknowledge those results today. Um, they, they were certainly breakthrough publications and reports at the time. And you might almost think that uh, with, with this work having been done, I mean, it, it, almost all of it before the end of the Victorian period, what more was there for the society to do? They seemed to have done anything, everything. Uh, you, you might remember that um, some of the early uh, research work was done on telepathy as well, and they thought that they had a convincing demonstration of that. Well, unfortunately, that was um, proven to be uh, fraudulent. Um, but again, that was another area that they had almost got in the bag before, before lunch. So it's not just Trinity Fellows and Oxford undergraduates who were out ghost hunting. Um, the term ghost hunter was coined in 19, uh, 1833, so it was already an old term. Uh, rumors of ghosts were drawing prospective hunters, sometimes in huge crowds throughout the 19th century. Uh, I'll just mention a few notable incidents. There was New York's uh, 27th Street ghost in 1862, and P.T. Barnum wrote about that one. Um, that was a, a major affair. There were even vendors in the street selling um, alcohol to the crowds that turned up to really kind of fuel their enthusiasm for the, for the ghosts. There were the Vienna disturbances of 1884, uh, ghost hunting mobs in Woolwich and Hackney, and they were reported in the Illustrated Police News in the 1890s. And there were also some hoaxes and sheets, as this one uh, here from an 1894 edition of Illustrated Police News shows. So the, the ghost hunting mobs were unsuccessful, as you might imagine. Um, and these ad hoc posses were never really going to be more than an occasional diversion. But with the demise of the university ghost clubs and the changing focus of the SPR, ghost hunting was still in the hands of the amateur. And here we have Irish writer Elliot O'Donnell, and he effectively created the ghost hunting uh, genre. Uh, working outside any sort of institution, uh, he was somewhat more than an amateur, but never really a professional, and funding himself through publishing. It was uh, the sort of role that you might think reprised in the 20th century by Harry Price, and uh, especially Peter Underwood later. Uh, he was born in the, the reign of Queen Victoria in 1872, and he was the first person to use the term ghost hunter of himself, as you see in the title of this book here, published in 1916. 
1928, he produced um, Confessions of a Ghost Hunter, and Harry Price also used that title himself uh, later in 1936. So very much, um, he started off as a novelist, and he reminds me a lot of Bulwer Lytton, but he, but he went further. So he started as a novelist, but when he came into the ghost hunting field, he presented these as first-hand real experiences. Um, you've probably read a few of his stories. They are very well known, and they're, they're very lurid. They're dramatic. They're not the usual sorts of accounts of ghosts that you might get from more sober writers. So they have a very um, fictional quality to them, even though he presented them as being real. Um, and he certainly eschewed any sort of scientific approach and described himself as formally of the Psychical Research Society. In this period, everybody seemed to get the name of the society wrong. They kept calling it the Psychical Research Society, but for whatever reason. Um, so there were tensions from the beginning between the SPR and popular ghost hunting. And that's reflected in the difference between a fact-based inquiry and entertainment. But ghost hunting also moved on from ghost mobs and literary adventurers, such as O'Donnell here. Five minutes. Okay. Now, you knew this one was coming, didn't you? You mentioned ghost hunters. You've got to see these guys. So, the face of modern ghost hunting, Grant Wilson and Jason Hawes, uh, from the appropriately named Ghost Hunters Show. But are they representative? I did a, uh, an in-depth survey a while ago, um, 402 questionnaires. 53 returns, response rate was within a typical range, um, and it's still the largest survey of its kind into ghost hunters. Uh, it was in-depth, produced uh, a document of around 70,000 words afterwards that I had to then painstakingly <laughs> analyze. Um, if we were to think of, you know, what is the statistically typical picture of the ghost hunter, um, we've got a male in his early 40s. He's spent about nine years investigating around 100 cases. And incidentally, Wilson and Hawes were both in their 40s at the time of this study. Now, neither Wilson or Hawes are modern versions of Bulwer Lytton. Uh, they're instead, they're plumbers. Um, they're t-shirts and jeans regular guys. And this is an important development in the image of ghost hunting as the occupation of the ordinary person. And I found this in the, the survey itself. You know, people came from all walks of life. Uh, there was no particular pattern. There were no students who were unemployed, um, but there were no plumbers either, or academic parapsychologists. Okay, so just ingest the statistics and we will move on. So these 53 ghost hunters had accumulated a total of 490 years investigating almost 5,000 cases. One person had personally conducted over 1,000 investigations. Uh, another had spent 40 years doing this. And you have to ask, why this level of dedication? It's significant. Um, two questions arise from this. You know, what is the original inspiration for their involvement? And then really, what were they hoping to achieve from it? So here we have the inspiration. Why do they get involved in ghost hunting? And for about one in three, it was a childhood experience. About one in 10, an adult experience. Um, and then we see here for about one in five, it was the media, film, TV, books. Um, for others, there were no, no particular catalyst that they could put their finger on, and the rest of the answers were too diverse. But you see, there was a, a particular divide here, and the, the, the only really sort of thought about this last night, between the first-hand experience and the second-hand experience. So first-hand experience accounted for about 41%. Um, but I want to go back and look at the figures again and see those diverse responses and see if there was anything more in that. Three minutes. Okay. So this is what, you know, what were they hoping to achieve? Is there such a thing as a ghost? Obviously, that is, you would think that. But, um, you know, sociology has to ask the obvious questions sometimes. Um, and in asking the obvious, obvious questions, we also found that people gave more than one answer. And they were also said that they were into ghost hunting for things like the thrill of the unknown or meeting interesting people. So they were in it for more than just the ghosts. And I think this is an important aspect too. Um, particularly the thrill factor, it feeds into things of what we know about the, the sort of paradox of horror, you know, the evocation of fear, particularly through watching uh, horror films, can be enjoyable. And I think this sort of thrill factor, this was, this was a significant aspect. 
Okay, this is um, just a, a smattering of some groups to show you the sort of typical names, the sort of um, aesthetics of their presentation. What I really just want to say here is that you'll see that psychical research is not being used. Research, yes, we've got that, but not psychical. Okay, so that's a kind of indication of further marginalization of the SPR. And we're seeing commercialization now of um, ghost hunting groups. Um, they're actually becoming events organizations, taking people around haunted houses, and really um, that's a major difference in the field. It's seeing um, a mainstreaming of ghost hunting because it's becoming a business, and it's also seeing it move much more towards entertainment, so away from personal thrill-seeking to a kind of provision of thrill-seeking. However, reactions to ghost hunting. The popularity of the paranormal, at least in the entertainment media, has an evil twin in the negative reactions to involvement with it. And we've seen that already today in the couple of papers um, Christine and Erica had mentioned um, negative reactions of people to their experiences. And time is running low. Victorian ghost hunters today. So, 100 years ago, SPR had over 1,200 members. Today, it's well under 1,000. And due to population growth, this also represents a less proportion of the UK society. And the paranormal is more popular than ever, but the SPR has not benefited. Instead, membership is in decline, threatening the future of the SPR. Why is this? Well, I think there are threefold reasons. There's a lack of awareness of the SPR, as I said right at the beginning. But there's also top-down pressure from academia. And, and that's, that's most of you in this room, actually. So <laughs> it's your fault. And there's also bottom-up pressure from the ghost hunters. The SPR no longer fulfills its original purpose to investigate. Um, it's become an educational charity. It does different things now. And fewer people are aware of the SPR. More people are doing what the SPR used to do without it. And they're really seeking something different in their engagement with the subject. Well, we've seen that the history of the SPR is not devoid of conflict. It's in another conflict now. It's been in a conflict before. There was an early break with um, spiritualists within society that almost brought the whole society to an end. Um, there have been various dissents over research directions then. I'm going to be finished in five seconds. Um, as well as being eaten away from the top and the bottom, we've seen the rise of ideological skepticism. That's also playing a role. Um, And then perhaps finally, we might think that this question about you know, investigating is not really the question at all. Um, the ghost hunters themselves, most of them believe that they have already had a paranormal experience, but keep on ghost hunting. Um, they're getting something else out of it. They're legend tripping, they're getting mystical experience, uh, mystical adventure in an age of disenchantment. These are things that the NSPR can't provide, of course. And as the old research becomes forgotten or suspect, the uncertainties remain. The term psychical research has certainly become superseded, but to phrase it in uh, a good Victorian phrase, the game is still afoot. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs>